Okay, so I think it's time to start. Yeah, it's uh, exactly in the 10 past. So um, uh, last time we started to discuss um, first of the logic uh, and a little bit about classical model theory. Uh, things to remember uh, is Gilder's completeness theorem and um, a Church's um, undecidability theorem. You cannot check if a formula is valid or if a formula is satisfiable uh, when interpreted uh, over all models. And then we discuss how this differs uh, when we restrict the models to the uh, finite. Uh, so in that case, we uh, call the satisfiability theorem um, um, the finite satisfiability theorem. The satisfiability problem called the finite satisfiability question or the finite satisfiability problem, and it differs from the general um, from the general um, um, uh, satisfiability question. Uh, and then we have a different structure, the broad theorem. Which says that uh, checking uh, satisfiability in the finite is even decidable. And a key distinction between uh, satisfiability in the uh, finite and in the infinite is the fact that one is recursively enumerable, other one is co recursively enumerable. Now, a uh, question to you if I have a problem that is both recursively enumerable and co recursively enumerable, then I claim that it is decidable. You can write a program that decides this problem. Don't, don't worry about how fast it is. But you can write a program that decides, uh, um, checks this problem if it's yes or no. How would you do this? Perfect. So you enumerate all the yes answers, you enumerate all the, the problems that have a yes answer uh, or instances, you enumerate all the instances that have a no answer because it's also co recursively enumerable. Uh, and you just uh, wait for your instance to show up in one of these lists. And this is how you can decide uh, um, if you if uh, your problem is both recursively enumerable and co recursively enumerable. Finite satisfiability is recursively enumerable. We can simply enumerate all the finite models. Uh, satisfiability in general is co recursively enumerable. Why is that? How can you write down a program that enumerates all sentences that are not satisfiable? Ah, this is where we need Gilder's completeness theorem. Gilder's completeness theorem tells us that if to check if a sentence is valid, if it's true in all the models, it suffices to find a proof. So you can enumerate all the proofs. This gives you all the sentences that are valid everywhere. Take their negations. And these are the sentences that are unsatisfiable. This is how you enumerate. This is why satisfiability in, the, in general is poorly considered in the world. Very interesting distinction between the finite and the infinite. Good. So then we moved to, to uh, the finite case and we started to talk about how the relational uh, data model is so fundamental to databases. Uh, it was um, introduced by Colin in the early 70s. And now there is a kind of a beautiful mythology around this about the success of the relational model. And we like to repeat it and to, to write um, to. Um, it tells its story over and over again. So I pointed you last time to uh, to this uh, paper that everybody should read. Uh, what goes up um, must come down by Stonebreaker and, and um, Joe Everstein. It's a bit of a read. Who read it? There's a paper. You have to read it. It's fun. You will really enjoy it. Uh, don't read the whole paper. Read the, the first two sections that talk about the relational model. Uh, it's amazing. You think about the languages back in the 70s. Uh, the popular languages were Algol, Fortran, Pascal, uh, BCDL, if I remember correctly, lots of languages. None of them survived. If you think about the, the uh, database that was introduced in the early 70s, that is a relational database, it still survives today. And this is the dominant model. Why is that? Why the relational model is so dominant? What is about it? That people simply couldn't replace it with. Uh, uh, the XML data model, the, um, uh, the graph data model, we have now graph databases, people try, and relational always wins. 
Because of the data independence principle, in the, what, what court prescribed back then in the 70s is that you should, should separate the high level logical uh, representation of your data and queries from how you implement it down, down below. This is the principle that survives. Uh, it means that in between, there should be a lot of cleverness and a lot of uh, optimization and, and compilation. Uh, but this separation between the um, in what we call the uh, what, what we want to do, what we want to get, and how to, to get it. This separation is what endures. This is what means the relational model for potential. So let's study the relational model. So just a quick recap. Um, here we go. No. Here we go. So uh, we we start with the uh, vocabulary of relations. This is your schema of the database. And a database instance is just a structure where each relation name becomes a concrete table, a concrete finite relation. Uh, we usually, in, 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 in theory, we all should also mention the domain, uh, which can be infinite or finite. We always need to, to mention the domain. But uh, we often drop it uh, because we, we, we assume that it consists of the active domain, which are the set of all the constants that occur in all the tables. Yeah, this is a uh, relational database. And the query is just the first order formula with three variables. And the way you read the query is that it will return uh, all the tuples of the size x uh, that satisfy the formula Q. Okay. And we have this uh, super fun example. Uh, I think all this is a little bit politically incorrect now. Um, uh, just because of alcohol and stuff like this, but you know, you're all over age, so you know what beer means. Uh, and uh, it comes from the first book on, on database systems, beautiful example with uh, drinkers uh, that frequent bars and bars that serve beers and drinkers that like beer. And we saw some examples, uh, find all the drinkers who frequent some bar that serve some beer that they like. These are kind of the same drinkers. Uh, very easy to write. Uh, these existential quantifiers are very easy to uh, to write in personal logic and also in SQL. Uh, but in personal logic, we can write equally well in universal quantifiers. Uh, find all the drinkers who uh, frequent only bars, who serve only beers that they like. Right? And then you can read it directly from the first order sentence. So a quick reminder from last time, this query is incorrect. This query is incorrect because it, why is it incorrect for the numbers? What was the name that we gave to the issue that this query exhibits? Yes. It's domain dependent. It's domain dependent. Uh, when we uh, quantify this, uh, this universal quantifier, when we quantify this uh, variable universally, uh, it's not, I mean, it, we need to iterate over the entire domain. Depending on how big that domain is, if it includes all the bars or, or if it includes something else, uh, the, the meaning of the query changes. Uh, which is an issue if you really want to, to take your theoretical path and say every first order logic formula is a query, well, it's not. You need to make it domain uh, independent. And we analyze this formula to some extent, showing that it is. Um, uh, that it, it, it is indeed domain dependent. It depends on the domain over which we um, iterate Y. Um, and um, uh, we gave a definition that the formula is domain independent. If it doesn't depend on this domain D, uh, it only depends on the relation that we have in the database, which is what, what one expects. Okay, uh, these two queries, just a quick refresher. These two queries were domain dependent for, for different reasons. The first one can return infinite sets. Why is that? Because if X is one of the elements in your finite equation uh, R, then you're free to take any Y you want. And if the domain is infinite, you might even get an infinite set of answers. So this is clearly domain uh, dependent. The second one is a little bit more subtle. Here, the answer is, uh, is always finite, 
because you only return the excess in your finite derivation R. But the issue is with the um, uh, with this quantifier, uh, you can imagine also a, a universal quantifier, but let's explain the existential one. So uh, the, we need to check if there exists a Y in the domain for which X and Y is, uh, is not in S. Now, if, if the domain happens to have all the elements in, in S or the elements in the second position in S, then um, the answer is false. There is no such Y. If the domain is bigger, then there is such a one. If you remember the equation. Uh, and my message is uh, about domain independence is really a side issue. It's not, it's not a major, um, not a major um, uh, research question. On one hand, checking that a, a form, a sentence is domain independent is undecidable. How do we, did we prove this? What, what theorem did we use to prove this? What was the name of that? Word? Yes. Uh, is it Trachtenbrock's theorem? Trachtenbrock's theorem. This is all, but we always use, we always use Trachtenbrock's theorem. It's a very, very powerful mm -hmm. theorem. Um, and I, I'm not going to go over the proof again. We went over it last time, but it's a, it's a very simple application, like all of them are. All applications of Trachtenbrock's theorem are very, very simple. Once you, you, you get a feeling of how to apply it. Uh, and uh, the second message, is that in practice you shouldn't worry too much. Uh, you can always write the queries in a way in which you enforce range restriction. Uh, also explaining this on pain on um, this pen and paper, how you should do this exactly is a nightmare. Uh, we tried to describe this last time and we, I think we highlighted the, the difficulties. Uh, but give me any example and I can make it range restricted. That's um, I can see. Um, I, I, I know it when I see it. I think that's, uh, yeah, so in the, in the example that we had before, what we need to do is we need to make sure that um, X comes from a finite set. Uh, and that finite set we can connect by checking that X is present in, in one of the relations that we have. Yes. Should, should, should I, when I read like QX, I implicitly think like for all x that satisfy the the predicate. So there's like an implicit, almost implicit quantifier there. Correct. Okay. There is almost like an implicit quantifier here. It means every x from the domain uh, for which this um, if you substitute uh, x is a, is, a, is a that constant, then this uh, sentence now has to be true in the finite database. But again, X can be anything in the domain, so we, we have to be careful we don't want this game from an infinite set. Okay, good. So uh, the other topic, this is where we stopped last time. Uh, the the uh, Hamburg said the success story of course, the original proposal was that, yeah, he came up with this idea, it would be elegant to use methodologic to write queries. Look how nice you can write his linker bar uh, uh, serves the example, although he didn't have this example, he had other examples, um, but obviously they're elegant to write. But how do you execute them? Uh, and back then they had very efficient uh, databases for that series about the, the, the state of the art. Uh, and people were wondering how, how can you execute this efficiently? Uh, now the concept that bridged the gap between this first of the logic high level description and uh, a potential efficient algorithm that concept is a relational algebra. Think of it as an intermediate language between this unwieldy methodology, which is elegant, but how do you evaluate it, and something that you can evaluate. Uh, how many people here have not seen a relational algebra before? Okay, a couple of you. So, uh, uh, quick, quick introduction to relational algebra. Remember five? There are five operators. Selection, projection, join, Union and difference. Uh, I'll show this uh, to you by examples. Uh, here is a simple query find all drinkers who like leopard. Uh, you write this in relational algebra by writing an expression. The expression takes as input uh, tables, uh, the base tables, you know, likes and frequency and, and uh, serves. And I always also like the, um, to write here the attribute because this is not very standard but it makes it easier to read what goes on. The selection 
is like, like a, any algebra, it's a unary operation, but it is indexed with a predicate. So what we what uh, how to read this expression here is that when you apply sigma to likes, you want only the subset of likes where the attribute y is equal to lambda. Projection is again a unary predicate, uh, and it is indexed by the attributes we want to retain. So in this case, we only want to retain the x's, uh, the drinkers. Okay, so we have seen selection, we have seen projection. Let's see uh, joints. So um, here is a, a very simple query, no quantifiers involved. Returns all the drinkers, um, drinker bar beer, uh, for which all this happens. The drinker frequency, the bar, and the bar serves the beer, and the drinker likes the beer. So uh, this um, leads, this is a representative in relational algebra using joints. So let me read the joint uh, for you. So the join is a binary operation. Uh, it takes as a lead two tables and uh, it combines stuff from the two tables uh, by using some condition, which I, I, it's usually written as a subscript of the join. I don't want to get too deep into relational algebra. Uh, in our case, uh, we assume that um, the, the, the condition that we are checking is that the values of the shared variables are the same. So we are checking here that the, the BRT served, served by Y is equal to the BRT liked by X. Uh, this is a, 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 a common assumption, but it's not the only one. Sometimes you want to, to write explicitly how you want to combine doppers from serves and likes. Okay. Uh, quick question to see if, I, if you get a good intuition about this join. So imagine an arbitrary join. I'm not showing you what these tables are, but I'm telling you each table has n doubles. Each table has n doubles. How, how big can the result of the join be? N doubles. Another bit because n doubles is not the right answer. Yes? N squared. Yeah, so uh, this is what the join does. It compares all combinations of toppers from the two tables. And there is a condition I kind of uh, don't want to, you know, to discuss too, for too long. There, is, there might be a condition, but that condition can be empty. Okay, uh, or I mean, can, can say, well, every topper with matches with every topper. Or it can say no topper matches, whatever you want to do. In this case, the condition is the, the beer from here must be the same as a beer from here. So it can never be bigger than n squared. It can be as small as empty, anything in between. And finally, we join again uh, with frequency. That's all I want to say about uh, joints. So we have seen selection, projection, join. Uh, let's see a union. Uh, I don't show a union. Union is going to have or. The uh, slightly more difficult um, First of the sentences that can still be converted into relational algebra are those that have um, uh, that have uh, universal quantifiers. The relational algebra is great at expressing its essential quantifiers. Uh, it's not designed to express easily uh, universal quantifiers, but there is a simple methodology to do to do, to get there. You apply a negation twice. To convert universal into existential. Yeah, so the way you read this is I, I want all the x's, uh, all the values uh, x that belong to A. And uh, there is, it's not the case that there exists uh, um, uh, some y that satisfies this condition. So when you uh, convert this into relational algebra, you need uh, this. The not becomes a difference, which is a standard set difference. Uh, and the end remains a join. Uh, we have uh, uh, no, sorry, this end is not a join. It's a difference because here we have another another not. Okay, I let you. I let you read this um, expression. If you don't understand it, let me know. Can you ask, like what like if this like graph slash tree display notation is sort of like has any. Deeper meaning. I mean, like I, I don't. I'm not sure what the one on the left. 
the sort of like right projection and let me explain that because I think it's super important. Um, if I can only uh, uh, there is an eraser on an eraser. So now I need uh, I need a marker. Does anyone see a marker? Well, thank you so much. You see the in, University of Berkeley policy three marker. It's still on the diagram. Okay, so <laughs> let's uh, let's start with this. Uh, this is plane algebra. I can write x plus y uh, times uh, z minus uh, w. This would be a standard expression. Uh, you, should, you should always think about this as a tree. This is a tree that looks like this. Uh, it's times between uh, plus of x and y and the difference between z and w. Those, those uh, trees, you should think of them as three representations of a much more difficult to read uh, relational algebra expression. You can go back and convert these trees into things like this. They look very ugly. Nobody does. We always write them as this. Does it make sense? Yes. Ask why there's like the AMX next to the Y Why is there? Ah, where does this A come from? Uh, that's a good question. Can somebody explain? I have plenty of time to look at it. Here is what we want to do. We want to remove from A, we want to remove all the axes that uh, satisfy this condition without, uh, without, the, um, without the norm. But when we, when we compute this thing, uh, the, the way I computed it, I'm oh, sorry, let me back there. The issue is not here, the issue is inside. I want to subtract from B all those values Y that occur in C. Can I write B minus C? I cannot write B minus C. Why can't I write B minus C? Why can I write can I not, can I not write this? <clears throat> we have a type mismatch. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was gonna say that they have different sizes. They have different sizes. This is a unary relation, has only x. The other one is a binary relation as x and y. I cannot write b minus c. So the trick is, uh, I need to give every y some x to, you know, to have a, like a partner so we can subtract uh, c. And you do this by uh, doing a Cartesian product, which is just a special case of a join, doing a Cartesian product with something that has an x. I do this with, uh, with a. Uh, it's it's a mouthful, and in practice, people don't do it this way. But they have a new operator called an anti-semi join. Look it up, find out what the anti-semi join is. Once you understand that, I claim you are half a way to become an, a, a database expert. Mm -hmm. Anti-semi joins are really uh, they're very simple, but the ones you get here, you really need to up with. Yes. So why isn't there a type mismatch at the top note then? Because we have a unary relation on the left hand side, the right hand side is a binary. Yeah, that's because of uh, my mistake. Uh, <laughs> uh, how should we fix it? A very good catch. Project. Project. So here I need to introduce a project operator because I don't need uh, Y anymore. I also realize it's not so obvious like here I can um, do the Cartesian product with, with A. I thought about it, I think it's correct, but you know, double check. Yes. So I guess you're going to think of the, the partition product as like a broadcasting operator that you use like the, like, Projection and broadcasting and like tools. Well, it's a, it's a very nice observation. Think about the Cartesian product as a broadcast. I, uh, every X is broadcast to all the lines. So then all the other. Yes. Um, so do we look at every single like operator or like every single node to have like, a base switch on them? So like if we, I guess I was kind of wondering what would happen if we had like a force, like find out. Can we just have like a bunch of like random like operators that we have to Right. So uh, uh, the, the question is, can I, can I have operators with more than two children? Uh, and this makes sense, for example, for union. You can have a union with multiple children. 
uh, it would make sense for joints, uh, but you have to be careful because uh, joints really need to take care of, of variables. Let me just say this, the relational algebra is not uh, a clean mathematical format. Uh, depending on your needs, you tweak it in one direction or another. Uh, people are used with you know, sort of tweaks. If you want your own tweak, you need to explain exactly what you mean by this. Uh, for example, adding these variables here is my own tweak to make it clear what the algebra is. Like. So yeah, you can play around with uh, higher arity, but you have to be careful what it was in. Good. That is a relational algebra. We are not going to talk too much about it, but it's really important to keep it in mind as a step towards efficient implementation, which, which is what happens today in the database systems. Uh, I, I want to say that first of the logic and the relational algebra are equivalent. That they express exactly the same queries. That would be false, because in first of the logic, we can shoot ourselves in the foot and we can write um, domain dependent queries. In the relational algebra, we cannot do this. We start from relations, which are manipulated, they always stay finite, and there is no, no dependence on the domain. Uh, but uh, one can prove that domain independent works all the logic and the relational algebra express exactly the same way, the same way. I strongly recommend that you try as an exercise to prove this. Converting relational algebra into first of the logic, that is not so difficult. You just need to make sure whatever you're writing down is domain independent. Uh, doing the opposite, that requires some thought. Because if you proceed inductively, you might find your universal quantifier. What do you quantify over? I'm going to let you think about this. Um, so, uh, and, and this, this equivalence, this is the part of the foundation of, of the relational data model. Uh, in, in first of the logic, uh, this is where we like to stay. This is where we, what we, where we would like to express queries. This is a what. Uh, while the relation algebra is a step towards the how, towards how we, we uh, execute it. If you think about a relational algebra expression or relational algebra plan, it's clear in which order we want to execute those operators. Okay, good. So that was my um, um, summary of the relational data model. I was hoping to uh, finish it last time, but I think we are, we are, we are doing fine. Uh, so some things to take away. Um, the relational data model is founded uh, on finite model theory. This is why we study it in, in, this, in this class. Uh, the uh, underlying principle that made, made, it, made the relational data model survive 50 years is the physical data independence principle. This is what makes it so pervasive. Uh, uh, yeah, keep in mind the separation between what and, and how. I should say this. This is the how I'm getting confused in the W's. Um, so, um, um, uh, what is what we want to get? This is what we express in the declarative language. Uh, how is how we get here? This is uh, what we express in, in the relational algebra. Also, keep in mind this is not the only use of first of the logic in databases. We also use first of the logic to express constraints, uh, maybe for optimization rules, maybe for verification. Uh, um, we also use it for, to express queries. There are multiple uses, usages of first of the logic. But the first, the first in, um, fundamental problem that I, I'd like to start to discuss with you uh, about um, um, from the relational data model is a query evaluation problem. Kind of the bread and butter of, um, of relational uh, databases. So let me start the discussion from here. Um, nobody talks about the Python evaluation problem. Uh, Python is a general purpose uh, language. You can write any, any Turing computable um, function and uh, I just need to execute it, whatever, uh, whatever the context of that language is. Uh, but um, First of the logic is restricted. We know it cannot express all possible computable functions, and we will get there slowly. Uh, and the, we would like to understand what can it express. And the first very rough 
approximation of what they can express is to, to characterize the complexity, um, the computational complexity of the queries that we can express in squares of the logic. This is a topic for them for this this part of the uh, of the lecture. Uh, later, we will also worry about efficient algorithm. But right now, I'm just I, I'm just going to worry about the complexity class. And the complexity class classes to keep in mind are here. Uh, I suppose everybody knows p time and and p. Uh, I suppose people know p space. Um, how many people don't know what p time and p and p space are? With, because it, uh, then we became proper. So I'm, I'm happy that uh, we are familiar with this log, log space or n log space. How many people know what that is? Uh, how many people do not know what that is? Okay. Um, I, I'll describe it when we get there. And I suppose very few people know what 80 zero is. Yeah, uh, and I describe that too. Um, good. So we want to study the complexity of queries in first order logic. Uh, now the query evaluation problem is in a, in a small <laughs> general form is as follows. We are giving us its input a query, think of it as a first order lo logic expression, and the database instance. Think about all the tables, big tables, big non-disk. And we want to compute the query on this database instance. So there are two ways to reason about the complexity of the query evaluation problem uh, introduced by Vardy in 1982. This is a very influential um, um, concept. The one way is to, to say the following. The query is fixed. I already fixed my drinker Bard's query. Uh, I know exactly what the query is. I want to know the complexity of computing the query is a function of the size of the input database. Uh, but I can do the context. I could fix a database. The database is fixed. Now I want to compute the complexity of uh, answering a query where the query is input. And I, the complexity will be measured in the size of the expression. This is called the expression complexity. The first one is called the data complexity. Or I, I can say both are inputs. And this is called the combined complexity. Now, think I'm looking about data or databases. Which is the most important one? Which would you care about? Yes. Fixing the database. Fixing the database. Uh, if you fix the database, then what you're thinking is that you, you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger queries. Uh, it doesn't quite happen. A SQL queries are not that big. We we'll discuss in a second. The, the most important one, and at least to me, is data complexity. Actually, I really look at the other two. I have a big gap, as my as a theoretician, I have a big gap in the, you know, understanding these, these complexity classes. I care a lot about the data complexity. So the, the query is fixed, but relatively small. The database is huge. I want to know what is the runtime as a function of the size of the database. Yes? Isn't the measure of the query impossible? Yeah, so th I, I left this day. Uh, uh, right now, what I'm heading is towards these complexity classes. Is this in polynomial time? Is this in NP? Is this in polynomial in P space? Where does it fit? Yeah, but later we really worry about the, it's going to be in polynomial time, we, we will worry about the exponent. Is it N cube? Is it N to the power four? And that will depend on the query. For some queries, it's an cube. For some queries, it's n squared. Some queries. Okay, I want to have one word about query complexity. I said that the, the SQL query is, is not that big. Uh, things are changing. So in the systems community, I know a couple of papers, very interesting ones, who looked at optimizing SQL queries with hundreds of joins. Very interesting. Um, that opens up theoretical questions, but I don't know of, of anyone working in on that, that space. Okay, so what is the data complexity of a query in FO? We fix a query, the query is fixed, and I want to know the complexity of evaluating this query uh, as a function of the uh, input database. And the theorem is that the data complexity is in this 
class AC0. It's actually in a, in a, in a smaller class for uniform AC0, but I, I will ignore the uniform one. So who is this uh, AC0? Uh, AC0 was, a, it's, a, it's a quantum of the hierarchy, kind of the smallest complexity, the easiest complexity for us, and we will be discussing. Um, notice that many, um, so this, this is a subset of log space, which I will then describe briefly. Uh, it's also a subset of polynomial time. In particular, every query can be evaluated in polynomial time in the size of the database. Even if it just takes this away, it's quite remarkable. It's not the case that every Python program can be evaluated in polynomial time in uh, the like size of the input. No other language has this property, as far as I know. Uh, but SQL has this property, very strong property. Uh, many uh, many theoretical papers, quite respectable ones, they claim that the data complexity is in log space. Uh, I don't want you to remember this. I want you to remember that it's here. It's really very, very low. And I will explain the difference. Let's first convince ourselves that every query you take, you can compute it in polynomial time in the size of the input database. So let's take this query here. Uh, some existential, some universal quantifier. Uh, this is domain independent as far as I know. And it just returns yes or no. It is a Boolean query. And uh, imagine you have these three relations. Think of them as arrays. You have an array of A, you have an array of B, an array of C. How do you evaluate this query? How do you write a Python program to compute this query? We think about this complexity. Don't try to be smart. You know, it's a, it's a like five minutes uh, interview question. Uh, yes, how will you do it? Um, I would think you could just like iterate over the entire database, like every time you encounter a quantifier, and just try to like evaluate the sub expression. Perfect. So we iterate for each quantifier and see what happens. So um, this is how it looks like. We iterate uh, X over all the values uh, that we have in our database. Suppose there are N values. Uh, we check A and then we iterate over all the Y and we just do the right thing. And I'm not going to read it. Obviously, this is in polynomial time. Yep. Uh, so the runtime in general, this query has two variables and uh, it runs in uh, n squared time, where n is a number of constants that you need to iterate over. In general, it's going to run in time on n to the power k, where k is a number of variables. Notice how important it is to say that the query is fixed. K is fixed. So the, the runtime is polynomial because K is fixed. But if you allow uh, the, uh, the query to be part of your input, then it's no longer uh, here. Yes? Why is it not K is the number of quantifiers? Um, well, each quantifier introduces a variable, no? Um, I think what you what you worry is I can um, I can actually reuse variables. I hope we get we get there because that's a fun thing to do. Uh, and then yeah, you can do Google and only use um, you do as many iterations as many nested uh, um, as many nested quantifiers. Right? But you're right. You, you you can optimize this in so many ways that we actually we study them how, how you can optimize this computation. Any questions about this? Uh, Simple algorithm. Um, I claim that uh, by, by expressing it this way, the problem is also in the log space. Uh, what is log space? This is a class of problems that you can solve with the Turing machine, uh, where your working tape, you have a separate working tape, separate from the output tape. The working tape has only log n uh, space. And look, if you examine this, uh, this, um, this program, you only need two variables. You need the X and you need the Y. This is all your working table. You also need the, the Boolean ones. How many bits do you need for X? Log n bits, similarly for Y. So you only need two log n bits and that uh, makes it uh, in log space. Every time you have nested loops, if the number of nesting is fixed, that problem is automatically in, in log space, uh, assuming that the loops are, are all bounded by the same end. Okay, good. So that was uh, an, an easy to remember proof 
that um, that every for every Kurzweil formula phi or or q I should say phi and q are share are the same should should be q. Um, the uh, it's it's data complex. It is in polynomial time. It's actually even better. It is in log space. But I claim that it is even lower. That it is in AC zero. So let's untangle this AC zero. So what is AC zero? It's a mouthful. Uh, it is a class of problems where for every problem size n, n is a number of 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 bits that you need to, to represent the input of such a problem. There exists a circuit uh, with the following properties. The size of the circuit is polynomial in N, uh, and its depth is constant. It's, it's independent of N. Uh, and the circuit has uh, gates, which are uh, end gates, or gates, they can, be, uh, they can have an um, unbounded fan in. Uh, and uh, you can also have not case wherever you want to have not case. Yeah, so think about this circuit as looking something like this. So you have your input bits, uh, and then you can have, uh, I don't know, end nodes maybe here, and maybe also some or uh, gates, uh, and maybe some, some not, not gates, uh, and you can combine them. Uh, you can also have unbounded um, uh, unbounded fan in gates. I hope this makes sense for them scribbling here. Uh, but uh, while n increases, the, the circuit that they're constructing, they always have, uh, must have a polynomial number of gates, a period of wire. This is how you measure the size. But the depth, the depth is constant. Uh, you, you cannot, it cannot increase with n. Okay, this might be confusing. Let's do an exercise. Here is an exercise. My problem is I have an, uh, the input is a graph. Remember that binary relation. And I want to check if this graph is a triangle. Let's check that this is in uh, in, um, uh, in, in AC0. What is the input? How many bits do you need to, de to describe the input of a graph with n nodes? n squared. Perfect. So, uh, you know, n, n squared, we, we can easily call n squared n, and this is the input. Yeah? So, we need n squared inputs. Um, so, I'm going to give an example where, where um, the number of nodes is four, and then we have n squared 16 um, uh, possible edges, but I only care about six of them. Why do I care only, why do I care only about, um, and sorry, n squared, yeah, n squared should be 16, but I only care about six because I'm going to avoid self loops. Because maybe I wanted to make it simpler. Also directed this. Uh, n squared implies that it's undirected, it's directed, but for undirected symmetric so you need to do it. You're right, you're right. So this is an, would be an undirected graph. I wanted to take it on the slide. Okay, so how, how do we construct a circuit that checks if uh, the graph has a, a triangle? And uh, you, what you do, you just enumerate all possible triangles you can have, uh, one, two, two, three, one, three, and, and so on. And the right is undirected, thank you. Uh, this is a, a Boolean expression. Uh, its size is polynomial uh, in n, to, to extend it from four to n. And then you construct your, your beautiful circuit that computes just this. As n increases, uh, the number of these will increase quadratically. The number of n nodes will increase, I don't know, like, like cubic. Uh, but you have a single or at the end, uh, and it's in uh, fan, fan in is unbound. And notice that the depth is always whatever it is, like three, three. The depth is, is constant. This is a class uh, AC0. All the, all, all the problems that you can express with circuits, polynomial size, bounded depth. Okay, so uh, let's uh, just hint at how the proof would go in general. Uh, so we need to prove that for every Boolean query and personal logic, uh, if the input uh, is a database, let's say whose active domain has size n, 
then we can construct a, uh, a circuit that checks if the query is true or not true in this in this database depending on the bits it is any uh, relations how do we do this well um, every relation of rdk like we did for graphs we can represent it with n to the power k bits uh, if the relation is binary then we need like a matrix if it's ternary we need a three-dimensional three-dimensional vector uh, next we take our our query which is in terms of the logic and we convert it into a boolean formula that is specific to uh, a domain of size n this is called also a lineage or the provenance of of this um, query it is that boolean expression that we obtain by specializing the triangle question to uh, a by concrete for, um, graph size graph of size four uh, and then we simply represent this this boolean formula using a circuit uh, and the depth of this this boolean uh, the circuit is the market. so a quick example um let's take this um this expression here uh when we specialize it for a complete n the existential quantifier becomes a big or now we need to to try uh, all the x's but we have a Finite, and we know we know how many how many x's we can have at most n. Uh, the universal quantifier becomes a big n, and it's not hard to see that you can construct a circuit uh, of depths five if I counted correctly, and um, size uh, of n. Squared. Yes, the circuit only has constant depth because we're fixing the query stuff, right? Yes. Okay. I see. Super important. If the query is variable. Everything breaks. Uh, the polynomial time no longer works because the exponent is escaped. So we come back to the query to the uh, combined complexity question. Good. So uh, this is what I want you to remember: the data complexity for first order logic, and we will not go beyond first order logic. We will go inside. So the data complexity is uh, always in AC zero. Uh, uh, and this, uh, in particular, means that the state of complexity is no bigger than the log space or no bigger than polynomial time. Uh, the expression complexity is a different different uh, matter. Uh, we will show this. Not sure if it gets here today. Uh, that the expression complexity is actually polynomial. Uh, P, it's P, it's a, it is in P space, and uh, it is P space complete for complete choices of databases. We'll get there. Another thing to remember is that in complexity theory this class ac0 which is kind of the bottom of all the hierarchy you can think in complexity theory the class ac0 is a class of, of uh, um, problems that can be very efficiently parallelized yeah you, the fact that you have constant depth it means that you only need a constant a constant number of parallel steps or the parallel steps might be big you need to schedule them on a few servers it's not not easy but uh, in, in principle, uh, there is nothing fundamental that prevents you from uh, exploiting parallels as much as you can. And this is why people say that SQL is embarrassingly parallel, which means that with, with good engineering, you can make uh, SQL be around uh, uh, you know, in, the, in the, with very good parallel context. Good. So, uh, with the 10 minutes, um, um, it ends at 12 .30. we end at 12 30. So, we still have uh, 32 minutes, right? Any questions so far? Uh, because I have, we still have two sections, I don't think I can finish them. We will continue next week. Uh, we don't want to rush, we want to, yeah, good. So, um, so we have seen F order uh, FO as a query language. Uh, but uh, there are reasons to uh, consider more restricted query languages that restrict the, the kind of queries that we can ask in various ways. Uh, so why do we why do we do this? Uh, one motivation is um, this negative theorem, Drachten Broad theorem, which essentially says that anything you want to um, check at compile time about your query, uh, any semantic property you want to check is undecidable. Uh, and um, um, but it turns out that there are interesting fragments. You can restrict um, FO to, to fragments uh, where 
interesting problems become decidable. And these fragments are still super in super useful in practice. So this is what we uh, where we are getting. To define these restrictions, we are going to talk about conjunctive queries most of the time, but there are other restrictions. And one way to, re uh, to define these restrictions, you restrict which of these um, connectives you can um, you can use in first order logic. You don't use all of them, you, re you only use a subset. And there is another way to restrict them, and that I, I will show you this on one slide pretty soon. So the most interesting class that we will study in this uh, is a class of conjunctive queries. Conjunctive queries, uh, they are queries that are uh, written uh, as a following first order logic formula. We have a conjunction of positive atoms, a conjunction of R1 of some variables, R2 of some variables, uh, preceded possibly with some existential quantifiers. And that's it. And so some example, uh, what does this query compute? E is an edge relation. Q returns a set of uh, pairs of points at two, one. Uh, don't read this yet. Uh, look at the query. So what does this compute? The pairs of nodes x, y, that have what property? That is to go to see. No, no, existent D. There are two apart. Yeah. There are two apart. Two pairs of nodes x, y, for which you can go from x to y in two hops. There exists a Z, such you can go from x to that Z and from Z to y. Pairs of nodes x, y that are two apart. Okay. Uh, so this is, these are conjunctive queries. I can write here as many atoms as I want. I can have some essential quantifiers if I want. I don't need this. Uh, and that's, that's it. Um, equivalently, uh, you can uh, think of conjunctive queries as restricting first of the logic to just take the essential quantifiers, which you put here, and conjunctions. You can mix and match, but you can always pull the existential, existential quantifiers at the top. So you can always uh, write a conjunctive query this for. Question, in order to express um, first order logic in definition of algebra, we needed five operators, right? Remember five? Selection, projection, join, union, and difference. <laughs> but now we have a fragment. Which, uh, which operators do you think are necessary and sufficient to capture every conjunctive query you can express in in with these conjunctive queries. So selection, projection, join, union, and difference. Uh, well, in order to, to, to do this, what operation do you need to compute an end? Join, really, we need join, perfect. Uh, what happens if I put a constant here? I say y is equal to node number seven. What operation do I need then? Because uh, this is about three. That's a selection, great. And how do I get rid of, of, of z? Projection. And that's it. Then we need a selection, projection, and join. Only three of the four survive. They also correspond to um, select this thing from where queries in SQL, or the one has to be careful exactly what what uh, what you allow in the prompt clause, what you allow in the where clause. Um, but you can imagine a cleanly designed uh, fragment of select this thing from where that corresponds to conjunctive queries. A beautiful um, um, restricted query language. We, again, we will discuss this most of the of most of the um, time. Okay, beyond uh, conjunctive queries, uh, sometimes, I mean, the next class is unions of conjunctive queries, uh, where we simply add an or. Uh, we take a union of multiple conjunctive queries with the only restriction that they must have the same arity. So it does make sense to take the union. So let me give you an example here. What does this query compute? All nodes that are either neighbors or or apart. Perfect. All nodes that are either neighbors or uh, what do we think? One apart. One apart. 
and can, they, they can be both, it doesn't matter. Uh, so they correspond to perthodologic formulas that we are happy quality, uh, conjunction, the essential quantifier, but you also allow disjunction now. You also allow for. In terms of relational algebra, we need to add union. So these squares are superset of the previous squares. These squares are superset. Uh, we will not talk too much about this because uh, almost everything is, we say about conjunctive queries uh, applies immediately to unions of conjunctive queries. So they will always be an afterthought. But it's good to know that we can also take the union and uh, the same good things happen. OK, um, let's talk about a different angle to think about quakes. Uh, monotone quakes. So, um, uh, OK, so consider two database instances. I'm going to probe my query with two, two distinct database instances. Uh, such that D is a subset of D prime. What I mean by this is that for every um, relation in D, that is a subset of the corresponding relation in D prime. Think about the uh, beers Binker bars. I have two beer Binker bars databases, but in the second database, every uh, relation, the, the frequency is, is a su superset of the frequency in the first database. Okay. We say that a query is monotone if uh, whenever you feed it in the first database, it's a subset of uh, the result of the second database. Let me say this correctly. We say that the query is monotone if for every two databases, such that D is a subset of D prime, the result of Q on D is a subset of uh, is the result of Q on D prime. Uh, my simple example, <clears throat> what does this query do here? Now you should be able to read it quickly. It's a Boolean query, what does it check? Is there a path of length two? Is there a path of length two anywhere in the graph? Now what happens is if the answer is yes, and you add more nodes, more, sorry, more edges, more nodes, it's still yes. Yeah, you never go from yes to two by adding, from yes to, to no by adding more, more stuff. But here is another example. What does this query do? I think of V e as a number as a set of nodes, the vertices. What does this query check? Uh, is there an, uh, a node such that there is an edge and that for every other node there is an edge from X to Y? I think this is not monotone. Why, why is that the case? Yes? Um, I don't refer to X to Y, but does it have any edges anywhere? Like, like you eliminate um, anything from like, this whole interval? Perfect. So uh, my answer was yes, but now I'm adding a new node to B, and that breaks this condition. Yeah, so I can convert it from, from a yes to a no by simply adding more nodes. Monotone, we, we love monotone queries. They have uh, many, uh, many useful properties. Every conjunctive query, every union of conjunctive queries is monotone. It's really an easy exercise. Um, and the only non-monotone operators, the things you, we want to avoid if we insist in keeping queries monotone are negation and versatile logic. Uh, also universal quantifier is also a form of negation, so we need to be careful. Uh, and difference in relation of algebra. Okay, so it's a useful concept to keep in mind uh, this monotone script. And by the way, I'm I'm thinking about um, listing on the on the possible topics for the final project uh, a, a difficult question on um, on monotone queries, um, uh, but I don't fully understand it. Uh, but the, the the good the good news that uh, here at Simon I'm next to people who do understand it, so I'm going to pose that the person who I, I know understands this question. It has it's related to the following very subtle question. Maybe you can think about this and tell me next time. Uh, if I give you a query in personal logic, you, uh, it's in personal logic, uh, it happens to be monotone. Uh, can, uh, but it doesn't, nothing prevents you from using negation. Maybe use negation in a very, very clever way, and the query is still monotone. Can you always rewrite it without negation? 
and without the universal quantity value. Um, I don't know what, what's going to happen here. But I really don't know the answer. Uh, and I know it's a promise that me study. Um, yeah, so just to give you a <coughs> sense of the interesting questions you can ask. Me. Good. So um, one way to restrict query languages is by um, um, this, and the way we, we saw. The other way is um, to answer question whether we allow operators between the variables like not equal, <coughs> less than, less than or equal by default. We do not allow them in conjunctive queries and unions of conjunctive queries. If we do want to allow them, then we usually annotate this somehow, uh, either by the superscript or by as arguments, we annotate this instead with this, um, conjunctive queries or unions of conjunctive queries with those um, relations. Quick question. Look at this query here, uh, where one question would be, what does it compute? But um, the, the, the question that I want you to think about is, is this query monotone? Is this query monotone? Yes. Yes. Can you explain why? Uh, well, I'm kind of just thinking about like the higher level interpretation, which is just that there's a path of like three where all the all the nodes involved are distinct. So then, if I add more edges, that, that will never get rid of any path. Exactly. That that way to think about it. Uh, not all the nodes are distinct, just because that doesn't fit on one line. And I'm very picky about the formatting. Uh, this is what I wanted to do. So here we only check that x is, but anyway, the, the principle is here. If we just have add these connectives, that still keeps the queries monotone. If we add more tuples, the, the tuples that were part of the previous answer, they don't go away. Uh, we just add more tuples. So this uh, does not uh, does not break monotone state. Yeah, so the query is monotone. Yes. Another way to think of it is that these are like magic relations that are defined on all the that like magic relations. You could replace it as like replace with with magic relations and then syntactically it is beautiful. So this is actually a very very deep observation. We don't call it a magic, otherwise it's a, exactly the observation. Uh, sometimes people call these uh, infinite relations. Imagine you have a big infinite relation that uh, lists all the pairs x u that are different. And then uh, this query is a standard conjunctive query. It just so happens that it uses three times that infinite relation. And there is no negation there. It's just a standard query. And the same happens for, for, for the others. This is exactly the right way to think about these additional predicates. They, they are like an, an infinite table uh, that give us um, uh, these relations. Okay, good, cool. Uh, before we, we dig in, start digging deeper into conjunctive queries, mm -hmm. I want to show you yet another way to restrict the query language. And I don't think we will have time to discuss this uh, in this quarter, uh, but it's really a very cool way to do this. And I, this is a slide where I can try to, uh, to make justice to this way of restricting. Think about first of the logic and uh, restrict the sentences you can write uh, restricts it such that you only use k variables, where k is fixed. The most interesting uh, such language is FO2, which means you can write any sentence, but you can only use two variables. You can give them names. You can only use x and y. What can you write with just x and y? And it turns out you can actually write some interesting things. Also, it's very it's still very limited what you can write. It's very uh, intriguing. Uh, for example, you can check if, if the graph has a path of length five. And initially, the first reaction should be, I, mean, I can't do this. I need five, five variables. But you don't need five variables because you can reuse them. You say you start with two variables. You say there exists a, a, an edge from x to y. And then when you want to continue, you reuse x and you say there exists a new x such that uh, we have an edge from y to x and then you say there is an x there exists a new y such that there is an edge from x to y and so on 
very interesting language. Uh, this has been very heavily studied. Here is uh, the, the interesting thing to, to remember. Um, um, uh, so sort of finite satisfiability for f of is equal that is the takeaway. Uh, but the sentence is actually more precise. It says the following: a um, a sentence in f of two has a model either finite or infinite. We don't care uh, if it has a sorry if it has a model. Then it also has a model whose size is at most exponential in the length of the formula phi. And therefore, you can check if that sentence is satisfiable. How can you check if that sentence is satisfiable? You simply enumerate, you simply iterate over all the models uh, of size exponential in phi, you check, check them one by one. Very interesting. Now, you should have an immediate question here. What about something else? If, if F02 is decidable, which means we can do anything we want here. We can check uh, equivalence. We can, we can do uh, magic things. It's only F02. What about F03? Yeah. Um, actually, this, this one might. Nobody, to my knowledge, nobody has applied this to, to anything practical, this observation. Um, but um, it, it's also a very limited language. Uh, what about the first three? Is it still decidable? Uh, it is not decidable, uh, but the way to, to uh, check, to, I mean, like, to answer this question is to pay a lot of attention when we put Trachtenbrot's theorem. Trachtenbrot's theorem says that uh, satisfiability and the finite is not decidable for arbitrary perturbable logic. So it will construct a concrete uh, 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 sentence uh, that kind of exhibits that unexcitability. Uh, we need to check carefully how many variables do we need in that sentence. And it turns out we only need three variables. And therefore, Tracht and Broad theorem actually even works for it both three. Yes. So like superficially, I feel like a query F03 looks like a three set, could look like a three set query. So are they kind of related? Uh, is that why? No, I don't. I oh. don't see. I'm, I'm, yeah, it's new to me. Sorry. Uh, but um, my, my quick reaction is three side is uh, in NTR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is in a decided way. That's why I don't see the question. Is there any nice circuit interpretation of this? Like, this FO2 would go down to some weird subset of AC0 that sort of makes intuitive sense? I don't know. It's a good question. So, uh, why is it the case that this is um, uh, decidable? So I, I looked at this paper, it's quite, quite nicely written. I strongly recommend the, you know, the introduction and the setup in that paper. But the actual proof is pretty boring uh, and it's pretty detailed. It dissects the formula and it, I don't fully like it. So I, I, I can't explain the proof because it's too complicated for me, my mind. Uh, so um, Grace's question is, is quite good. Uh, is there something deep, is there something else here that explains decidability? I don't know. Yes, Joe. I feel like the connection is stack machines in a power up, right? If we have a, a stack size of one, then that will two. We can only hide one variable, so we have to use the other one. We can only reuse one variable, so we have to keep the other one. Uh -huh. So we only need one stack. We're only allowed a stack of depth, of, of depth one. We only need a stack of depth one. Ah, I see. I see. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. Maybe that's not the way to. Uh, the, the, this paper actually improves on an earlier proof, but it's still not not a fun proof to me. Although the all the history that they describe there is beautiful, I recommend it for that reason. Good, cool. So we still have twelve minutes uh, to at least start the discussion of conjunctive queries. Um, uh, so for conjunctive queries, I need to give you a little bit more terminology. Uh, we call the query a Boolean query if all the variables in the conjunctive queries are existentially quantified. Actually, we call any orthodontic query a Boolean query if it's a, a sentence, if there's no free variables. Uh, we call it a full query uh, if there are no existential variables. So look, look at the difference. This se uh, sentence here uh, is true or false. It checks if there exists some path of length two. 
This is not a sentence. This is a formula that it refers all the triples or uh, nodes x, y, z for which um, uh, that form a path of length to. So it returns all the paths of length. Uh, just terminology. First one is called Boolean, second one is called full. We often have something in between. We don't have a name for that. Uh, sometimes we, we care about whether the same thing with same relation can occur twice in the query or not. Uh, if it occurs twice, uh, we sometimes call it uh, a self join. It's a join of the relation E with itself. Uh, if we don't like, we, we don't want uh, the same relation to occur twice, and we say it's without self joints. So then the query looks like this. And uh, fi uh, my, my final observation is that I'm going to often uh, omit the epicenter quantifiers by just listing the head variables, and all the other variables are uh, uh, assumed to be existentially quantified. So you might, may see me might making this self uh, assumption uh, in this Yes. Why is it important to make the distinction like between with self joins and without? Uh, it, uh, it definitely, so it, from what I'm coming, this makes a huge difference in probabilistic databases. Uh, because if you compute the probability, then it matters if you conjoin the same event or not in the reasonable to overlap. It makes a huge difference. And I really hope to be able to cover that as the, the nice aspect of probability databases. Uh, it also matters for. So I let, let me stop there. Yeah, so there, there are specific questions for which it matters. Yes. So I should think about the output of a query as like a set of tuples. Mm -hmm. What should I, how should I think about the output of a Boolean query? Ah, how should we think about the output of a Boolean query? Remember, we had this discussion that Boolean algebra is a subset of perfect logic. If you take a relation of RT0, what can the content of that relation be? Oh, empty set or empty set with an empty support. Empty set or the empty support. That is exactly how you should think about this query. Empty set means false. Empty super means true. Very important when we talk about monotonicity, we actually used this um, observation implicitly because we said false implies true, true implies true, but true does not imply true. It's not subject of this. Good, cool. So um, uh, again, most of our discussions this quarter will be focused on conjunctive queries. Uh, the extension to union comes almost for free. Uh, and uh, what I want to do, and I still have seven minutes, we should at least um, start this. Let's re-examine the evaluation problem when the query is restricted to be a conjunctive query. So we already know the data complexity for conjunctive, for evaluating uh, any query. You fix a query, data complexity remains zero. So, but now uh, let's also look at the combined complexity and the query itself is, is part of the input. Okay, so um, we are actually should have shown you this slide. So we know the data complexity is, in a, is zero, but what is the expression complexity or the combined complexity? It will answer it. And the answer is uh, for conjunctive queries, this is an uh, NP, and uh, it's actually NP uh, complete. Uh, but the same construction gives us almost for free the uh, combined complexity for first order logic. Okay, and before we, we get to the actual um, technical development, um, we need to, uh, to kind of look at conjunctive queries from different angles. There are so many equivalent ways in which you can think about conjunctive queries. And here they are. I can think about a conjunctive query as we did before. It's a conjunction of atoms, and I'm not showing here the existential variable. I'm not showing the uh, conjunction of atoms. You can take the same query, and you can think of it as a concrete database instance, a relation R and a relation S. I gave them attribute names, so we have some names, but they really don't matter. The content matters. You see how I construct this, uh, these relations from the query. Very straightforward. I just took every atom, like R, X, Y, Z, uh, and R, U, V, W, and every atom becomes a tuple in the relation R, and similarly a tuple in the relation uh, S. 
Uh, this is often called the canonical database associated to this conjunctive query. But you can also think about a conjunctive query as a hypergraph. What is a hyper? What is a hypergraph? How does it? How does a hypergraph differ from a graph? A, in a graph, every edge connects to nodes. In a hypergraph, uh, every hyper edge, is what we call it, connects multiple nodes. That's the only difference. So here is a hyper. Here is a hypergraph that represents the same uh, conjunctive query. We have a, a hyper edge that connects three nodes x, y, and z. Another hyper edge that connects the nodes u, v, w. And then we have three more like regular edges that connect these pairs of nodes. Yes. So when you see the canonical database instance, is that like, should I think of that as the minimal database instance such that the conjunctive query value is true? Beautiful. You're kind okay. of uh, several slides ahead. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah, this is kind of the, the, the um, minimal, it's actually not necessarily the minimal, uh, but it's kind of the most not the free, if you want, database on which the query is true. Uh, good question. That's because of monotonicity, right? Because if it wasn't monotone, then it wouldn't be able to guarantee the first. If, yeah, if you if you throw in a negation here, or you know, all hell is loose, I have no idea what what, what to do. Uh, but uh, you, you suggest an interesting question. Is this a smallest database on which this query, if I make it a Boolean query, on this which this query is true? Can you make it even smaller? I can make it very small. This is everything X. Everything X, exactly. So uh, R has a single tuple, XXX. S has a single tuple, XX. Uh, and then all these atoms are satisfied because you can map the variables to that um, single constant X. Okay, so three different ways to look at conjunctive queries. Um, and if we will often switch back and forth between them without uh, much problem. Yeah, so we simply consider them uh, given. Um, the, the other concepts of how far should I go here? Give me a second. Yeah, uh, two more slides, and then we will take them. We will stop here. So um, I also want to introduce homomorphism. How many people know what a homomorphism is between two graphs? Okay, so kind of uh, 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 a homomorphism between two queries generalizes us that notion. So we have two conjunctive queries. Uh, they um, better use the same uh, relation names, but I use here R and S because I don't want to make any assumptions for uh, how these relation names overlap. A homomorphism from Q prime to Q, you, you always like to go from the, the second to the first. So homomorphism from Q prime to Q maps the constants and the variables in Q prime to constants and variables in Q, such that the constants are mapped to themselves over here. Uh, the variables can be mapped to either variables or constants. And the requirement is that for every atom in, in, the, in the Q prime, uh, after you apply this, this homomorphism, you get an atom in, in Q. So, uh, uh, that atom is obtained by applying the homomorphism to all the variables uh, <coughs> of S, and of, uh, of course the new atom must have the same uh, the same relation. It's a it's a mouse code, but it's really very intuitive. And the head variables need to be mapped to the variables. Is this is equivalent to or stricter than logical equivalence between the two? Uh, it, there is a connection. Uh, what it means, uh, yeah. So graph homomorphism is a special case. If we have a homomorphism. Let me just stop with this question. If we have a homomorphism, um, I can say something about the answers to, of Q and Q prime on any given database T. Given a database T, you, you compute Q on D, you compute Q prime on D, and you can make a statement about these two results. Will they be equal? Or what can you say about these two results? There are um, no, think about um, inclusion, subtle. One is a subtle of the other. So Q of E, Q prime. Q prime. 
Q implies Q prime. Q is a subset of Q prime. Yeah, because uh, if I evaluate Q on that database, every answer I get uh, to Q, by this, this homomorphism, I can convert into an answer to Q prime. And this is why Q prime returns even more answers than, than at least at least all the answers. So that's the direction where we are heading uh, next time. Okay, good folks. So um, we'll stop here. Um, and I see you when we see okay. uh, And, and uh, remember the homework. We have a deadline. So please uh, submit the homework to before this. Yes. Thanks. Well, I was going to say that I would have.